Purgatory, Chapter 24, Duration of Purgatory, The Duelist, Father Schuf's An Apparition at Antwerp. The following example shows us not only the long duration of the punishment inflicted for certain faults, but also the difficulty in inclining divine justice in favor of those who have committed faults of this nature. The history of the Order of the Visitation mentions, among the first religious of the institution, Sister Marie Dennis, called in the world Milde Marie Margnet. She was most charitably devoted to the souls in purgatory, and felt herself particularly drawn to recommend to God, in a special manner, those who have held high positions in the world, for she knew by experience the dangers in which their positions exposed them. A certain prince, whose name is not given, but who is believed belonged to the house of France, was killed in a duel, and God permitted him to appear to Sister Denise, to ask of her the assistance of which he stood so greatly in need. He told her that he was not damned, although his crime merited damnation, thanks to the act of the perfect contrition which he had made at the moment of his death. He had been saved, but in punishment for his guilty life and death, he was condemned to the most rigorous chastisement in purgatory until the day of judgment. The charitable sister, deeply touched by the state of this soul, generously offered herself as a victim for him, but it is impossible to say what she had to suffer for many years in consequence of that heroic act. The poor prince left her no repose and made her partake of his torments. She completed her sacrifice by death, but before expiring she confided to her superior that, in return for so much expiation, she had obtained for her protege the remission but of a few hours of pain. When the superior expressed her astonishment at this result, which seemed to her entirely disproportionate with what the sister had suffered, Sister Denise replied, Ah, my dear mother, the hours of purgatory are not computed like those of earth. Years of grief, weariness, poverty, or sickness in this world are nothing compared to one hour of the sufferings of purgatory. It is already much that divine mercy permits us to exercise any influence whatever over his justice. I am less moved by the lamentable state in which I have seen this soul languish than by the extraordinary return of grace which has consummated the work of his salvation. The act in which the prince died merited hell. A million others might have found their eternal perdition in the same act in which he found his salvation. He recovered consciousness, but for one instant, just time sufficient to cooperate that precious movement of grace, which disposed him to make an act of perfect contrition. That blessed moment seems to me to be an excess of the goodness, clemency, and infinite love of God. Thus spoke Sister Denise. She admired at once the severity of God's justice, and his infinite mercy, both one and the other, shone forth in this example in the most striking manner. Continuing the subject of the long duration of purgatory, we will here relate an instance of more recent occurrence. Father Philip Schuess of the Company of Jesus, who died in Louvain in 1878, related the following fact, which happened at Antwerp during the first years of his ministry in that city. He had just preached a mission and had returned to the College of Notre Dame, then situated in the Rue Empire, where he was told someone asked for him in the parlor. Descending immediately, he found there two young men in the flower of their age, with a pale and sickly child of about ten years. Father, said they, here is a poor child that we have adopted, and who deserves our protection because he is good and pious. We feed and educate him, and, for more than a year, that he has formed part of our family. He has been happy and enjoyed good health. It is only for the last few weeks that he has commenced to grow thin and pine away, as you now see him. What is the cause of this change? asked the father. 
It is fright, they replied. The child is awakened every night by apparitions. A man, he assures us, presents himself before him, and he sees him as distinctly as he sees us in full daylight. This is the cause of his continual fear and uneasiness. We come, Father, to ask you for some remedy. My friends replied the Father, With God there is a remedy for all things. Begin, both of you, by making a good confession and communion. Beg God to deliver you from all evil, and fear nothing. As for you, my child, say your prayers well, then sleep so soundly that no ghost can awake you. He then dismissed them, telling them to return in case of anything should happen. Two weeks passed, and they again returned. Father, said they, we have followed your orders, and yet the apparitions continue as before. The child always sees the same man appear. From this evening, said Father Schoofs, watch at the door of the child's room, provided with paper and ink, with which to write the answers. When he warns you of the presence of that man, ask in the name of God who he is, the time of his death, where he lived, and why he returns. The following day he returned, carrying the paper on which he was written the answers which they had received. We saw, they said, the man that appears to the child. They described him as an old man, of whom they could not but see the bust. And he wore a costume of the olden times. He told them his name, and the house in which he had dwelt in Antwerp. He had died in 1636, and followed the profession of a banker in that same house, which in his time comprised the two houses, which today may be seen situated in the right and to the left of it. Let us remark here that a certain document which proves the accuracy of these indications have since been discovered in the archives of the city of Antwerp. He added that he was in purgatory and that few prayers had been said for him. He then begged the persons of the house to offer Holy Communion for him and finally asked that a privilege might be made for him to Notre Dame des Frivres, and another to Notre Dame de la Chapelle in Brussels. You will do well to comply with all these requests, says Father Schuss, and if the spirit returns before speaking to him, require him to say the pater, ave, and credo. They accomplished the good works indicated with all possible piety, and many conversions were effected. When all was finished, the young men returned. Father, he prayed. They said to Father Schuss, but in a tone of indescribable faith and piety, we never heard anyone pray thus. What reverence in the Our Father! What love in the Hail Mary! What fervor in the I Believe! Now we know how it is to pray. Then he thanked us for our prayers. He was greatly relieved and would have been entirely delivered had not an assistant in our shop made a sacrilegious communion. We have, they continued, reported these words to the person. She turned pale, acknowledged her guilt, then running to her confessor hastened to repair her crime. Since that day, adds Father Schuffs, that house has never been troubled. The family that inhabited have prospered rapidly, and today they are rich. The two brothers continue to conduct themselves in an exemplary manner, and their sister become a religious in a convent, of which she is at the present time superior. Everything leads us to believe that the prosperity of that family was a result of the succor given to the departed soul. After two centuries of punishment, there remained to the latter but a small part of the expiation and the performance of some good works which were asked. When these were accomplished, he was delivered, and wished to show his gratitude by obtaining the blessings of God upon his benefactors. Purgatory, Chapter 25 The Duration of Purgatory The following incident is related with authentic proofs by the journal The Monday in the number of April 1860. It took place in America, in the Abbey of the Benedictines, situated in the village of Latrobe, 
A series of apparitions occurred during the course of the year in 1859. The American press took up the matter and treated those grave questions with its usual levity. In order to put a stop to the scandal, the Abbot Wimmer, superior of the house, addressed the following letter to the newspapers. The following is a true statement of the case. In our Abbey of St. Vincent near La Trobe, on September 10, 1859, a novice saw an apparition of a Benedictine in full choir dress. This apparition was repeated every day from September 18th until November 19th, either at 11 o'clock at noon or at 2 o'clock in the morning. It was only in the 19th of November that the novice interrogated the spirit in presence of another member of the community and asked the motive of this apparition. He replied that he had suffered for 77 years for having neglected to celebrate seven masses of obligation, that he had already appeared at different times to seven other Benedictines, but that he had not been heard, and that he would be obliged to appear again after eleven years if this novice did not come to his assistance. Finally, the spirit asked that these seven masses might be celebrated for him. Moreover, the novice must remain in retreat for seven days, keep strict silence, and during thirty days recite three times a day the psalm Miserere, his feet bare and his arms extended in the form of a cross. All the conditions were fulfilled between November 20th and December the 25th, and on that day, after the celebration of the Mass, the apparition disappeared. During that period, the Spirit showed itself several times, exhorting the novice in the most urgent manner to pray for the souls in purgatory. For, said he, they suffer frightfully, and are extremely grateful to those who cooperate in their deliverance. He added, sad to relate, that of the five priests who had died in our abbey, not one had yet entered heaven. All were suffering in purgatory. Do not draw any conclusion, but this is correct. This account, signed by the hand of the abbot, is an incontestable historical document. As regards the conclusion which the venerable prelate leaves us to draw, it is evident. Seeing that a religious is condemned to purgatory for seventy-seven years, let it suffice for us to learn the necessity of reflecting on the duration of future punishment, as well for priests and religious as for the ordinary faithful living in the midst of the corruption of the world. A too frequent cause of the long continuance of purgatory is that many deprive themselves of a great means established by Jesus Christ for shortening it, by delaying, when dangerously sick, to receive the last sacraments. These sacraments, destined to prepare souls for the last journey, to purify them for the remains of their sin, and to spare them the pains of the other life, require, in order to produce their effects, that the sick person receive them with the requisite dispositions. Now, the longer they are deferred, and the faculties of the sick person allowed to become weak, the more defective do those dispositions become. What do I say? Very often it happens, in consequence of this imprudent delay, that the sick person dies deprived of this absolutely necessary help. The result is that if the deceased is not damned, he is plunged into the deepest abyss of purgatory loaded with all the weights of his debts. Michael Alex speak of an ecclesiastic who instead of promptly receiving the extreme unction and therein giving good example to the faithful was guilty of negligence in this respect and was punished by a hundred years of purgatory. Knowing that he was seriously ill and in danger of death, this poor priest should have made known his condition and immediately had recourse to the succors which the Mother Church reserves for her children in the supreme hour. He admitted to do so, and whether through an illusion common among sick people, he would not declare the gravity of his situation. 
or whether he was under the influence of that fatal prejudice which causes weak Christians to defer the reception of the last sacraments. He neither asked for it nor thought of receiving them. But we know how death comes by stealth. The unfortunate man deferred so long that he died without having the time to receive either the viaticum or extreme unction. Now God has pleased to make use of this circumstance to give a great warning to others. The deceased himself came to make known to a brother ecclesiastic who was condemned to purgatory for a hundred years. I am thus punished, he said, for delaying to receive the grace of the last purification. Had I received the sacraments as I ought to have done, I should have escaped death through the virtue of extreme unction, and I should have had time to do penance. 